We would like to welcome everyone to our Tuesday, April 20th City Council meeting. Uh, we feel privileged that we, you have chosen to spend some of your valuable time with us as a council and staff and our public and all of our friends, our residents and business community. Before we get any further, I'm going to ask our very meticulous assistant city manager, Nat Rojanasathera, to explain to folks how they can participate in our meeting, other than just watching us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor Robertson. There are two ways to participate in city council meetings. The first is to join directly on ZoomGov using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device. And the second method is to join by calling into the meeting by telephone. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, you can use the link or the phone number that's listed on the meeting agenda that can be found at isearchmonterey.org. And since the meeting is already started, you'll find that agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, please dial toll-free 1-833-568-8864, and then you'll enter the meeting ID, which is 160-772-9333 pound. And if you're, entered, if you're prompted to enter a participant ID, please press pound one more time. Detailed instructions on how to use Zoom is available on our website at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raised hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone this afternoon, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and then unmute yourself by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. I'll be calling on each speaker in the order of their hands raised and ask that everyone stay within the three minute time limit that we've established for today's meeting, which will also show using a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. This meeting is also being streamed live on YouTube with a 10 second delay and then on Comcast channel 25, which has a 90 second delay. And as always, we look forward to receiving public comment today. Oh, well, thank you, Nat, for that excellent introduction. And so we'll call our meeting to order. I'm very pleased uh, to be your mayor. I'm Clyde Roberson, and your caring city council is Dan Albert, Alan Hoffa, Ed Smith, and Tyler Williamson. And so we're going to go right into our presentations. We're very pleased to have with us today, Katie Castagna from the United Way, President and CEO, along with Calissa King. And I, I saw both of you are in our panel. And so we're so very happy to have you with us. And I said in my introduction about all of our friends of Monterey and certainly Katie and Calissa are friends of Monterey. And I know the United Way has, is going to talk about 211 this evening, but I wanted to say how much we appreciate you during this pandemic. You have really stepped up in a wide, wide variety of ways. And one of which is getting kids ready for school and collecting uh, backpacks and supplies and so on. And guess what? Now they need them because they're back in school. <laughs> we made it after a year. And so thanks for all that you do. Then from that, I want to turn it over to the marvelous city manager to, uh, for any introductory remarks before he turns it over to our friends from the United Way. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You, you did the perfect introduction uh, of that topic. Um, uh, if I say it uh, in this way, I, 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 I don't mean any disrespect, <laughs> but what I'm saying is 211 really has become a major powerhouse over the past uh, 12, 15 months uh, or 12 months with the pandemic. Um, the, the profile of 211 uh, really has sharpened over, over the 12 months. It became uh, all of a sudden uh, a, an indispensable uh, tool in, in, in the toolkit of reaction to uh, various uh, challenges that were imposed to us through the pandemic. Um, we, we uh, and Kay, I don't want to steal Katie's uh, and Kalissa's thunder, but uh, they they have really become um, a multi 
agency um, agency that that uh, helps us uh, to to perform our our core functions and and uh, as, as Katie will tell you every call received to 211 regarding to the city of Monterey is one call less that that would land on, on our phones and allows us to concentrate on other tasks so uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to to um, uh, have uh, both of them here tonight, and I'm really looking forward to their excellent presentation. 211 uh, has become a major player in this county, and I'm so glad that, that we have them here tonight to present to us. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome and introduction. I'm just thrilled to, to be back to see you. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have some, some slides I want to share with you. I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, Calissa King, who is our uh, Director of uh, Information Referral and Partnership Development. Um, and just a side note about Calissa, she is a graduate of the Middlebury Institute and a resident of the city of Monterey and uh, has joined our staff um, in the last year. and, and um, has become a, a really instrumental part of our 211 system. So, so my, um, uh, if I may share my screen, I would like to um, bring up my updates. And I just wanna say as warm as your introduction was, I feel the same way about the city of Monterey. And um, I, uh, since the beginning of, certainly when we founded 211 in 2009, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, so, so uh, United Way Monterey County, as the operator of 211 here in the county, um, uh, has uh, had a wonderful partnership with many stakeholders um, since our uh, start in 2009. Um, and part of our strategy is to um, bring in city partnerships. And Monterey was was right there at the beginning. And I just want to thank you and thank you for the opportunity to come back. I think every year I come back, and you keep ask, you you keep allowing me to do so. Um, and it, my purpose um, is uh, twofold. One, first of all. As you said, um, I wanted to share out, this is a photo of one of our call specialists. Uh, this is Rosie. And so it's uh, fun to be able to just um, share out somebody actually doing, doing the job. Um, my purpose today is to do a little refresher on what is 211, um, to share with you some of the adaptations we have made um, uh, related to COVID-19 and talk about some of our special initiatives in 2020. Some of them were actually pre-pandemic and were really cool and unrelated to COVID-19. And then of course, many others um, are directly related. In addition, we've uh, had some work with the, the uh, other disaster of the year, the California wildfires um, here locally. And then we're gonna share some data with you, both countywide as well as um, specific to the city of Monterey. <laughs> Um, we'll talk about how your um, uh, participation in our financial structure has been instrumental. And then also, and, and I'm preaching to the choir, you are part of our new rental assistance program, but I wanna share out some information about that as well. So that's the, the game plan in the next uh, 10 minutes. And um, again, just as a, as a refresher, 211 is a free information and referral helpline, connecting people to the services they need. We know that there might be wonderful services out there, but if people don't know how to access them at the time they need them, then they're not doing anybody any good. Um, the original concept from behind 211 was a three-digit dialing code. And of course, over the years, we added other ways to access that information via website search, as well as via text. And um, the, the original concept is that people call us, we have trained professional um, call specialists who listen to the need and search our database and make a referral to the best match of, of services. And then the caller then is equipped with that information and go, can go forward and directly contact agencies themselves. In um, that model, it's really kind of an open loop. And we often, we do follow up calls to find out how did it go for you? Um, but we don't always know if the person landed at the agency's doorstep and received the, the help they need. And that's part of the innovation we've done with, um, in, in particular with the um, rental assistance and other ways to close that loop 
and make sure we know what happens on the other end. So this year has been extraordinary and um, uh, I wanted to share with you some high level numbers about the activity with 211. So we, we closely track the calls. Um, this graph shows you by month what our call volume has been since January of 2019. So you'll see the blue bars are, are 2019. You'll see a little spike in the um, uh, winter months when we do our free tax prep program. Um, and a lot of people do connect to that by calling 211 and getting referred to that. Um, and you'll see that on a, you know, in 2019, a good month was about a thousand calls. And then the orange bars are the uh, 2020 calls. And we were actually down a little bit in January and February. And then of course the pandemic hit and you'll see that, um, you know, starting in March, our call volume increased significantly throughout the year. And the types of things people called about changed. Originally, we, we heard a lot about what is this shelter in place? What does it mean? What can I do? What's open? What's not? You know, mask ordinances. Um, uh, what is the coronavirus? Where do I go for testing? And you can kind of see this unfold throughout the year. We had a lot of concern about the economic impact, a lot of calls early on about food. Always we have heard from the community that they need help paying their rent. We know this is an expensive place to live. And so I remember even that first year we launched 211 that, that um, housing um, uh, questions and needs were, that were at the top of the list. But that persisted through, of course, the pandemic. And um, when we were able to administer our uh, rental assistance program in the fall, and I'm gonna come back to you with a little more detail about that later on, um, you'll see the calls spiked in October, November, December. You'll see those orange spikes. And um, we were able to connect people with assistance in growing numbers. Um, and, and again, that's you know two, three times our normal high call volume um, of, of prior years. And then the red bars just show what's happened the first uh, quarter of this year. And that's really being driven by two things. Um, in addition to the needs I've mentioned, one is vaccination, and we've been working to um, support the county and helping people register for vaccine. And then the other one is um, a, the new rental assistance program. So I think the, the numbers speak volumes. And along the way, we've also um, enhanced our searchability online, and um, we've started to use that software for closed loop referrals to, to help better coordinate um, people's access to the services. And so now I'm gonna turn this over to Calissa King to speak briefly about some of our initiatives and then dive deeper into the data. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I think Katie just really did a great job showing us how the needs have really increased and we're seeing a lot more calls. And so our special initiatives have been able to help support those needs um, a little bit before the pandemic. And then of course, during the pandemic. So. As we'll see um, on the screen, we've been able to support diabetes awareness, and that really happened through 211MontereyCounty.org in collaboration with CHI, and we were able to develop a new diabetes icon. So if you visit that website and you click that icon, it will get you connected to different resources in the county that have um, different, different uh, programs and just various resources around diabetes, whether that be prevention or for folks that um, do have diabetes. We also were able to support um, the census outreach. Um, we were able to help assist with the kinship navigator assistance. And so that's for kinship families, um, special resources for them and providing resources to that kinshipcareca.org. And then we've been able to support for COVID response, like Katie spoke about, um, just the up-to-date information, whether that be around stay-at-home orders or just as the landscapes change um, regarding face masks and what the protocol should be. And then really the special initiatives that we're continuing to support um, are the Great Plates Delivered program. So for seniors, um, 65 and older and then 60 and older with medical conditions in order to get them connected to food delivery service from local restaurants. Um, so we've worked with the county on that. Then the vaccination rollout, getting folks signed up for vaccine appointments. And we've really been working with the health department on that initiative in order to get folks signed up. Um, and that is a service that's still being offered. It's 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Residents can call in and get connected to a 211 call center specialist in order to see if there's a vaccine um, appointment available that they would like to sign up for. 
Um, and then we continue to support the rent and utility assistance. In the first phase of the program at the end of last year, um, 211 helped support with the application um, assistance for um, rent and utility screening. And then we have continued to support that initiative with the new round of funding. And then also sharing out information in relation to low cost internet um, for affordable broadband. So that's for families um, that are low income and looking for um, internet services. So we've been able to direct folks to, um, low, to the screening tool that's listed on the screen um, so that they'll be able to be connected um, to low cost internet options. Um, and now, yeah, looking at the disaster relief, I know Katie um, mentioned it, um, we've worked in close collaboration with the Office of Emergency Services, and that has been really critical, of course, during the pandemic in order to have the most up-to-date information um, for 211 to share with residents, but then also to share back the different needs that we've seen. But it was especially critical during the fires. Um, we were able to share out information in relation to evacuation orders, um, also just you know different resources like shelters of that nature, so that folks were able to get know if they needed to be evacuated and if they were evacuated, what resources were available to them. And so these are just some of the numbers um, in relation to those needs that occurred during the wildfires that 2 one was able to support with. And then our call data. So Katie showed the graph um, that showed us 2019, then 2020, and then 2021. We have already seen it go off the charts. And so with 2020, um, we'll see that it's a 109% increase um, from what we had seen in 2019 um, at 19,268 calls, um, 495 two-way text. So that's someone that texted their zip code. Um, to that 898211 phone number and then also a lot of folks accessing our web search um, through that 211monterecounty.org and on the right hand we'll see just the different needs that have been reflected um largely we'll see around housing utilities and food and transportation so really thinking basic needs um and then of course that seven percent in income and employment five mental health and substance abuse um, nine, legal, consumer, and public safety, 7% healthcare, so thinking like especially needs related to COVID um, and information around COVID-19, and then 5% individual um, family and community support. And if we look at the next slide, we were able to break that down specifically for the city of Monterey. And we'll see that that housing, utilities, food and transportation, that it is a much bigger percentage when compared to the county in general. And then the breakdown from there. And what I was able to do is I was able to actually pull the data um, for what were the top needs within these um, very broad categories. So I'd like to share this with you all. Um, looking at housing, utilities, food and transportation, the top need within that category was rent payment assistance, followed by food pantries, and then followed by electric service payment assistance. For income and employment, it was the VITA tax preparation service. Um, within mental health and substance abuse, we had talk lines, warm lines um, was the top need within there. Then legal, consumer, and public safety was general legal aid. Healthcare, we had it tied um, between COVID-19 testing and then communicable disease control for COVID-19 needs related to that. And then for the individual family and community support, it was area agencies on aging were the top need um, within that category. So we see in Monterey, uh, in the city of Monterey, uh, 211 has been widely utilized for a variety of different needs, especially um, in relation to housing, utilities, food and transportation. And I know um, just you know seeing the numbers on the screen and just the number of calls, um, it's very significant. And I know at 211, we're really proud to have been able to serve the city of Monterey in the way that we've been able to. Thank you, Calissa. And a part of our sustainability strategy is to um, receive and, and um, partner with many organizations and receive support um, throughout the county at many levels. And so you'll see our uh, current list of supporters. Um, and of course, as I said, City of Monterey is amongst them. And we appreciate your annual uh, participation financially and want to thank you very much. Um, the, the other thing that I think is important about this is really thinking about 211 as part of our infrastructure. Who among us would have thought we'd be using it the way we are now, even a year ago? Um, and if we didn't have that strong infrastructure in place, um, we, I, I think we would really be missing out on uh, some very effective tools. And so um, the, uh, Calissa went through the calls and, and we see that they 
are you know often driven by the the crisis of the day but personal crises happen every day in homes in our community and so the calls you know from the woman trying to flee a domestic violence situation or somebody seeking mental health or wanting to know how to enroll in CalFresh for food assistance. Um, those, those calls um, continue regardless of what, um, uh, what specific special initiative we have going on. And it's because of broad-based participation that we have 2-1-1 as a tool to provide the connection. I do wanna just briefly give a, 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 take a bit of a deeper dive into our rental assistance program. Um, which you are part of and we're thrilled about. Um, we uh, are uh, working with the county to coordinate new funding um, from the federal and state governments to uh, prevent homelessness. And so really to address that housing crisis that you are all too aware of. Um, this is based on the successful model we had in the fall. And I know that really much of it was kicked off when the, the city of Monterey talked about having rental assistance specifically for your own uh, residents and uh, people formerly employed in the city who needed assistance. This um, is a bit of results from the CARES Act funding that we distributed through the county showing how 211 as a tool to leverage that assistance countywide was able to um, help people in all, all parts of our county. Um, the, uh, in this case, um, Monterey is probably uh, proportionately smaller because this was running at the same time you had your own program. But what's interesting to me is even with your own program, we know there were other folks that were able to be helped through the, um, the, the CARES Act funding that we coordinated through 211. And again, the point of entry is 211. We work with partner organizations who then help do the fulfillment and payment of assistance. And, and I have a similar um, chart showing the utility assistance. And uh, this for me really shows the power of 211 as part of our infrastructure to make accessible to people in many different places and from many different walks of life, um, what can be really a life-saving benefit. And then our process for the current program, think of yourself as, as an agency that is in the center there. People can access um, the rent and utility assistance that we're currently administering um, either by calling 211 um, or by applying directly online through our uh, website or directly through mcrenthelp.com. And those uh, applications are then assigned to a partnering organization. So in the case of a resident of, of Monterey, if they, you may have a relationship with them and be um, working with them already, but if somebody hasn't made that connection, they could call 211 and we would refer them to you. And uh, so we're working very closely in, in coordination with 13 agencies to again, scale this up countywide. And as a quick uh, reminder, the uh, part of the parameters of this program um, set by the state is that landlords who participate need to um, agree to forgive 20% of the past rent that's due. And um, we're finding a great interest from, from many landlords. And, and the, the goal of this, or one of the huge benefits is to really, um, take a big bite out of the crushing debt that some people have accrued during the pandemic in their uh, inability to, to keep up with rent. Um, so we are, uh, we've just rolled that out in the last month and we're again, thrilled to be working with the city to um, ensure that we're getting this benefit out to as many people as possible. And this is for rent as well as utility assistance, both um, in arrears and up to three months going forward. And, and that's really the end of our formal presentation, but I'm happy to stop and take any questions you might have. Well, uh, thank you, Katie and Calissa. That, that was just so overwhelmingly fantastic, all of the services that you're providing people. And I know that the pandemic has uh, really compounded all of the, your services and the needs that people have. 
and just by the sheer numbers of 100% on phone calls and 400% website hits. That's just incredible. And how you all you kept up with it is just to be admired. Council question, comment before we go to the public. Council member Tyler. Hi, Katie and Calissa. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's always a pleasure to have you all come in and share the good work that you all are doing. Um, I think 2-1-1 is, is an essential service for our entire region. So I appreciate what you all do for us. Um, I would just ask, what would you say or see as maybe one of the largest challenges? I imagine it may have something to do with the huge increase of um, demand th that's been created. Um, but I ask this to the extent of um, maybe looking at potential ways that the city could, if there was a, uh, uh, a way for us to provide additional support, what that might look like moving forward in the future. That might be a tough question to ask right or to answer right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to have that be an open-ended uh, offer, actually. But I, you know, I, I do want to say one of the biggest challenges I think we all face is is that of information and and keeping information and communication up to date. And so I do want to just we didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we keep our data fresh, which can be a little bit boring. But but what's not boring about it is that it, it is a real time. Um, database of information. And so thinking about from the city perspective, all of the wonderful programs and services that the city either is offering or promoting in partnership, um, please remember that we are just an email away as far as updating that information to make sure that it's always current when somebody calls and needs it. So that's, that's off the top of my head, just, you know, continue to communicate about resources. Um, and I don't know if Calissa has anything else to add. No, I think that that's honestly a, a really great aspect and please at any point if there's a change in services or a new program, I'm the email so please email me and I'm happy <laughs> to make sure that we get that updated because I know um, it can, that makes all the difference when somebody's calling looking and sometimes they'll hear about a program and be like, oh, is, you know, what do you know about this? So yes, please keep us updated and I'm more than happy at any point to make any modifications. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks again for all the work you guys are doing. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Council Member Ed. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, I want to say thank you for all of the hard work and the staff at, at 211 and United Way that really has launched a program and has grown. Uh, Calissa, great presentation. Katie, you're a pro. You, you do this all the time. But again, it was it was great. We're going to work on some artwork for Calissa's background. So um, oh. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're going to get you something from the city of Monterey to show you the ocean. Um, so I, I just wanted to say those numbers are um, very revealing in terms of just not the impact of COVID, but, um, you know, as it goes with success as an agency as you are, it's more success and mm -hmm. the growing a connection and outreach uh, I would suspect that those numbers will soften a tiny bit as we recover from COVID. However, all of those people that reached you will again reach you. So your success will continue to grow, which then adds the responsibility and the burden of staffing and deployment and, and programs and all of that. So we look forward to seeing how we might be able to shepherd in the expansion of communications, but great job and we're glad you're there. And uh, you absolutely have been a, a great service for Monterey County. So we're, we're pleased to hear how effective it is. But uh, you're very successful. And uh, with the success does come a burden of uh, you're going to have more work coming. <laughs> but thanks for all your work. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great observation, Ed. I hadn't thought of it that way. And you're absolutely right. Anyone else? We'll go, uh, do we have any uh, public comment, Nat, on this item, please? We don't have public comment on this item, Mayor Rupertson. All right. Well, then with, with uh, gratitude, Katie and Calissa, you're certainly welcome to hang out and during our council meeting, but if you have something else to do, like answer a 211 or, uh, or the 25,000 emails that Calissa, you just got while we were speaking because you told us we you were the contact. We're certainly glad you're with us um, and we'll look forward to continued partnership. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the opportunity. Thank okay, you. and say hi to mom and dad and, tell, uh, and we want to know when Bridge is starting again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. All right, then uh, we again have the pleasure of receiving a presentation on parking operation enhancements. And so we'll go ahead and turn it back to our city manager who will introduce, I'm sure, a couple of members of his uh, meritorious staff. Yeah, many thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, um, uh, as council is aware, we started about uh, two and a half, three years ago, a systematic review of our parking operations. Um, we, we used um, a very capable parking consultant at that time. Um, and basically since then, uh, the, with, the, with the approval of the city council, we have done uh, quite a few upgrades and changes into our parking operations. And as I um, summarize that, we, we basically completed the step from the 20th into the 21st century with our parking operations. And uh, there are quite uh, very uh, quite a few changes that we implemented over time. But one of the the benefits of our system also is that on Monday mornings I can check in with the parking superintendent and I see how we were scoring in our parking uh, uh, operations. How how full were our garages? How much did we had on street parking? How many people used uh, apps? For paying the parking bills, what was the water, what is the waterfront looking like, and that data uh, is actually helping us also to a certain degree to predict uh, uh, TOT and sales tax. So we we have a, created quite an interesting system there. Uh, long gone are the days where uh, our team on Monday morning hauled in uh, five six bags of quarters and uh, put them into the revenue office and they were counted there. Um, I, I still remember those days when then the Brinks truck came and took the cash directly out of the revenue office to ensure that nobody crazy needed uh, the quarters for their own laundry. So uh, with that uh, further ado, I, I think I punted over to Steve Whitry uh, to who will set this up. Is that correct, Steve? And then uh, uh, we will have our parking superintendent, Christy Steffi, do a a pretty interesting and, and, and complex presentation to us. Yeah, thank you, Hans. You know, just a few words. It's, it's not often that we get to actually be, come in front of council with a, a presentation of what we've accomplished. Usually when we come to council, we're looking for uh, support on something, funding for some operations or things of that nature. Uh, this one, we really want to just uh, celebrate what we've been able to accomplish with uh, your assistance as we come through uh, the city council with different uh, items forward. So. Without really much further ado, I want to let Christy Steffi take on uh, the rest of the program. And you know, just a reminder, and I'm going to get in her script just a little bit. Is you know, there's a lot of slides that she has here. She's going to go through them fairly quickly. This presentation will be available uh, to you guys and to the public at, at a future date. We'll push it off uh, through uh, Clementine and Lori Welga to make sure that people can get the information. So with that, uh, Christy, go for it. <laughs> Hi. Um, make sure I'm unmuted and this is my first time presenting on Zoom, so I think I've got it figured out. I just wanted to get this launched, make sure you can see it. Yes, we can. Very good. Good start. Okay. Excellent. Um, sorry, is that still presenting? Yes. I feel like I had to rearrange my screen a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so go ahead and get started. Oops. Okay, so good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Christy Steffi and I'm the Parking Superintendent. I'm excited to be here this afternoon and share some new enhancements and recent projects that have helped transform the Parking Division. As a brief overview, the Parking Division is made up of four sections, which include our Administrative Office, Enforcement, Maintenance, and our newly established Parking Services section. The parking division oversees 31 parking facilities and approximately 3,500 off-street parking spaces and over 3,000 on-street parking spaces. Mm. Over the past three years, the parking division has been going through a trans transition from enhancing our parking program by upgrading technology and funding capital improvement projects to maintain our aging facilities. These enhancements and projects have all been funded and supported by the parking fund, which is fully self-supporting through generated parking revenues to support all parking expenses, capital improvement projects, and 25% of the parking revenues generated go to the general fund. 
This presentation is intended to highlight those recent implementations and projects and that have been supported through, through with council approval. So I have a lot of content to cover. If there's anything I skim over too fast, you know, feel free to interrupt me. I also wanna make sure that each of you get a copy of the presentation um, so that you'll have that for reference as well. Sorry, I'm... <laughs> I'm new here. Okay. All right, am I on the recent projects slide? Yes, you are. Okay, perfect, thank you. So as a brief background, Dixon Resources Unlimited was retained by the city in June of 2018 to perform a parking operations analysis. The analysis provided an in-depth review of our existing parking program and resulted in the parking action plan that was presented to council in July of 2019 which outlined our near, mid, and long-term steps to implement an effective and efficient parking program for residents as well as visitors. There have been some major improvements that have been completed and several efforts that are still in progress. I'm excited to share some of those in depth and detail on the, on the accomplishments. Okay, recent projects. In addition to the program enhancements, there have been several capital improvement programs, or capital improvements, and deferred maintenance projects that have been completed, which have improved facilities. And I wanted to share some of these highlights, which are also supported by different divisions in the city, but funded through the parking fund. Okay, so one of the new features is in July of 2019, the parking division contracted with Condor Security to provide overnight private security services in our downtown east and west garages downtown Cayo Principal garage, as well as the Cannery Road garage. This added resource has been beneficial in keeping presence in our facilities and has helped support PD in their efforts to deter criminal activity and loitering. As part of Condor's roving patrol, they also notify parking staff of any incidents, damage, or vandalism. So introducing Park Mobile. Park Mobile was one of our first program enhancements from the parking action plan. It was introduced in all of our off street parking locations in December of 2019. The mobile payment app introduced a convenient way for customers to pay for their parking using a cell phone app. It proved to be popular with customers until COVID shut down, in, shut down our operations in March of 2020. As parking operations slowly resumed, Park Mobile was, a pop, was popular with our customers as a payment alternative and also provided contactless payment solution. In November of 2020, Park Mobile was expanded to all metered on-street parking. The next integration for Park Mobile is planned in our gated facilities and is expected to be completed this year. Once completed, Park Mobile will be a consistent payment alternative in all paid parking locations. Okay. And for our parks equipment, one of the most exciting upgrades for the parking division was the replacement of our outdated parks equipment that was more than 14 years old in four of our attended facilities. Parks is our parking access and revenue control system, which is now provided by TIBA. The TIBA system provides a significant upgrade that introduced new technology and provides 24 seven operation in our facilities. The four facilities included a combined total of 20 lanes of equipment that included 11 entry lanes, nine exit lanes, in addition to the installation of 15 new pay stations. The system upgrade also included LPR, which is a license plate recognition for each lane entry and exit, as well as intercom buttons and pinhole cameras on, on all the new equipment. Although these facilities are now automated, we have successfully integrated technology with customer service by establishing a central command center and roving attendance to assist the public. The command center can monitor all four facilities in real time, answer all incoming calls from the intercom and provide remote assistance to the customers. The upgrade was planned and in progress when the unexpected shutdown due to COVID happened. We decided to leverage the timeline and opportunity to install the new TIBA equipment while our facilities were in low demand. The downtown east and west garages were the first to go live on January 26, 2020, followed by the Cannery Row Garage, which went live September 16, 2020, 
And lastly, the waterfront lot went live January 4th, 2021 after the second shutdown. We are all still learning and leveraging the new system in preparation for when the demand returns. So um, new meters. Um, in addition to installing the new parks equipment, another significant technology improvement was the upgrade to all on-street parking meters. This project involved removing 533 outdated meters that had been in use since 2008 and installing 304 new solar smart solar powered smart meters. One of the unique features of these new smart meters is the ability to use one meter head as a dual meter to serve two spaces, which reduced the investment in equipment required to meter 533 single spaces. The project was completely supported and led by the parking maintenance staff and was happening simultaneously with the parks equipment installation. The meter replacement project began September 21st and was completed by November 3rd, 2020. Park Mobile went live um, as a payment solution in November 2020, which provided real-time updates to the meter for customer convenience and ease of enforcement. Another exciting feature I wanted to highlight was the ability to map each individual meter, which provides access to a source of real-time data, including if the meter is paid. In August 2019, the parking fund purchased the building located at 150 Del Monte, adjacent to the West Garage. The, the purchase of this building provides opportunities and much needed space for the relocation of the parking division staff, which has outgrown the existing office space. And for our waterfront lot, the waterfront lot is one of our busiest lots and the renovation of the lot was phase one of the waterfront parking lot area improvements to better serve the public and operations. The project began in November 2018 and was strategically planned during the slower season where there is less demand and half the lot remained open and operational to the public throughout the construction. The final construction was completed in May 2019, which was just in time for the busy summer season. As part of the TIBA upgrade, the attendant booths were removed and the lot is now fully automated with a blend of customer service from our roving attendants who assist customers at the pay stations and at exit. At this time, the Waterfront Resource Recovery Project is in progress and is expected to be completed this June. Okay, so moving on to our downtown garages, there have been several projects over the past few years that have improved the downtown facility such as the ADA improvements, which provided a safe path of travel for pedestrians, a new drain separator installed to prevent sediment and oils from going into the bay, along with a few other projects that are listed here for overall improvement. I also wanted to share one of the added benefits of automating the East and West garage with the TIBA system is that they now operate as one facility instead of functioning as two separate garages. We also updated sign the internal signage and added new elevator wraps on each level to let customers know that we've changed the way you pay with the automation of the facilities. And these have been effective in getting customers attention and adaption. Okay, for Cannery Row. Cannery Row Garage has also had several exciting upgrades that include new signage, paint, new themed levels, throughout the garage, as well as some significant capital improvement projects, such as the elevator and closure project and the roof lighting project, which involved replacing 28 corroded poles and installing new energy efficient motion detection lighting. And even when activated at 100% energy level, they are still 60% more efficient than the old lighting. On the right side of the slide, I have a picture of the elevator wraps that were done for each level in the cannery row garage that carry the interior theme of the levels to the lobby. And since there's two elevators there, the second elevator also has the same wraps as the downtown garage that lets customers know that we've changed the way you pay. Okay, and... Here are some before and after pictures of the Cannery Row Elevator Enclosure Project. This project addressed safety concerns, environmental concerns, and improved the reliability, which is expected to reduce the maintenance cost. 
Okay, and then this is also some before and after pictures. These are the improvements in the signage, um, the wayfinding signage that was updated along with the painting where you can see um, in those middle pictures where you can see the painting, the new elevator enclosures, and then just the um, entrance signs as well. Okay, and then um, another project um, was our Cannery Row Lot 7, which is located at Foam and Irving. This lot is 90 spaces, but is, a, but is in high demand um, due to its convenient location to the aquarium. This project was completed in three phases and included ADA improvements, preparation for electrical vehicle charging stations, resurfacing, as well as the addition of a new pay station for customer convenience. Okay, and then parking rates and fees. So parking rates and fees are a parking management tool and are essential to a self-supporting operation. Revenues generated through parking rates and fees are used to support the parking program, upgrades, and funding capital projects. Rates and fees had not been raised in over 10 years. In June 2020, citation fees were increased as a cost recovery. In July 2020, minor rate increases were implemented in paid parking locations, and permit fees were increased effective January 2021. With the implementation of new rates, a zone a new zone-based pricing was established for on-street parking and Cannery Row. And with the new permit fees, two new permit programs were established in the downtown lot 11 and upper lot seven. Okay, in December, 2020, the parking division reorganized staffing to better support operations for an effective, efficient and sustainable program. The reorganization established the new parking services section, which now supports the automated facilities from a central command center and roving attendants. And then for the local economic stimulus plan, although it may not be a program enhancement or a project completed, however, the parking fund in combination with the Thailand funds was able to support the successful economic stimulus plan in response to the financial impacts of COVID without impacting the general fund reserves. Okay, so I wanna take this moment to also share with you some of the exciting things that are currently in progress and coming soon. So as part of the parking action plan, one of the objectives was to evaluate our existing residential parking program, which has been in place since 1985 with the first program approved on Jackson Street. Since then, the program has expanded to, into 17 established residential programs with over 4,000 permits issued to residents. The very first community meeting was just recently held on April 14th to invite the community members to discuss parking challenges for feedback and recommendations as part of the ongoing effort of revising the outdated program to be more effective and efficient. It was the first of several meetings to come and we are actively planning a survey to send out to engage residents as well. Okay, with the automation of the downtown garages, waterfront lot, Cannery Row garage, we're actively working on ways to improve our signage and overall appearance of the interior of each location. Here are some draft ideas that, to, that explore the op option of repurposing the Cannery Row exit booths, creating a pedestrian path of travel and carrying the themed levels onto the lobby of the Cannery Row garage. These are still in draft phase and have not been finalized or decided, but wanted to take this opportunity to share with you some of the exciting ideas that we're looking at. And kind of continuing on that same um, draft signage. The, here are some more examples of signage ideas in the waterfront lot, which include a monument sign to clearly identify the entrance of the waterfront lot, which is also consistent with the wayfinding signage in Cannery Row. These are also draft plans that are not finalized. In addition, we're exploring the idea of introducing a parking mascot. The parking mascot can help promote the park mobile payment, but can also go beyond that and be a consistent image throughout all lots and garages and provide helpful information and reminders. The mascot design is also in draft form, but wanted to give you an example of what it might look like and use. I also have a sample of a digital wayfinding sign, which can provide real-time occupancy information to help direct the public 
on Del Monte to the best available parking. Okay, and as I mentioned, the waterfront lot renovation was phase one of the project. The portion of the marina lot is planned as phase two and is scheduled to start this fall. On the left is the current layout of the lot, and on the right is the draft design for the new layout. Okay. And for EV charging stations, there are six new EV charging stations that are planned this summer, which will replace four outdated existing charging stations. This will be the beginning of more e charging stations beginning, being planned and throughout the different locations to provide more accessibility and convenience for EV drivers. And in fiscal year 2022, we are expecting to replace three outdated enforcement scooters. With the addition of the new fleet, we are also working with our citation processor to bring LPR, which is license plate recognition, enforcement back in use, which will allow enforcement by plate and open up opportunities that will provide for virtual permits, which can be residential permits or paid parking permits, as well as access to um, uh, street and parking lot occupancy as part of the technology that'll collect that data. Okay, and then just for some additional noteworthy, um, we have a few other upcoming projects that are expected to be completed this year, which include the introduction of Flix Bus to Monterey beginning service on May 6th with a tentative scheduled to operate five days a week. The breakwater resurfacing project is scheduled to begin this fall and we're currently working on the RFP, RFP to replace 30 outdated pay stations in our off street parking lots that have been in use for over 14 years. And I, with all that said, I want to thank you for your time and the opportunity to share some of the exciting enhancements and projects that parking's been working on over the past few years and with the support of council. Um, I feel like I've covered a lot and I want to just open up, feel free to ask any questions. And I also just want to remind you, I know that we went through that kind of quickly, but I will make sure you get a copy of the presentation as well. Well, good, Christy, you did a really marvelous job for your first Zoom presentation. Thank uh, you. Your, your slides, your slides were very clear. I really enjoyed that you know, with the graphics. Uh, if you're looking for a, another mascot, I'll, I'll offer Gracie my rat terrier. Well, that's and a great idea. She'll, she'll put the bark in, in the enforcement for you. And so, <laughs> and a very impressive how uh, much uh, technology that your, your department has incorporated. You really are on the cutting edge of technology. So thank you so much for your presentation. Council uh, questions, uh, comments before we go public? Um, I've got a question. Yes, please, Council Member Allen. Yeah, well, first of all, um, congratulations on the good work. I think um, I really appreciate the direction that you're going. Um, I did have a question about the rates. So one of the goals of the rate adjustments that we did, um, I think adopted last year, was to try and influence um, driver behavior mm -hmm. and kind of entice drivers to use the parking garages if possible. And I'm, I'm wondering if, it, and obviously it's been an unusual year, so maybe it's really not possible to judge yet, but in the areas where the rates were changed, um, ha have you seen any of that uh, change in driver behavior yet? Are we seeing the lots used um, more, the, the parking garages used more heavily? Unfortunately, because everything has been unusual, I have not found anything that is steady or consistent. I, everything that was projected or predicted with those rate increases all became skewed with the, with COVID. So we're starting to see parking operations are coming back and we're starting to see that I can at least compare over last year and starting that new trend, but I, I just don't have any real usable data to come forward with to, to answer that question just due to the COVID, the impacts of it. That's what I anticipated, but I thought I'd ask anyway and and um, hopefully maybe next year um, we'll be able to hear um, how that's going. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Anyone else? This board, yeah. council member Dan. Thank you. Um, flex bus is a service. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what, what is that? 
Flixbus is a yeah. bus networking, and so they are setting up a new route, and they wanted to add Monterey to the to the route. So they would be um, bringing visitors to the city as well as, as as part of their stop on their route. So on this one, it included um, Santa Cruz, San Luis. Um, I think LA was on there. Um, they're still kind of putting that 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 um, agenda together of what that looks like, but it, it is starting it out on a trial program to see if this is something that works. It does seem like an unusual time to to start up a bus mm -hmm. networking, but it, it, they're mm -hmm. pretty optimistic. Okay, thank you. I, I do have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about fee uh, structure change, but I was a little confused because I know that we increased our fees, but you mentioned that our fees haven't been changed in 10 years. So I wasn't quite sure what you what you were talking about there. Oh, sorry. I probably I was referencing that prior to our rate and fee um, changes, they hadn't been updated in ten years. So after in at, in ten years, I, they hadn't been raised, and we did it. So I, I probably put that backwards. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. I get it now. But I, I'm just curious. Uh, I know that our TOT has changed because we were so far behind in raising our TOTs for. 30 years or however long it has been. How, how do we compare to other cities, either on coastal cities or our competing cities uh, when it comes to parking? Well, with that rate change, we did we did look at six comparable cities and we are within range of that. We do, um, we do have a second rate increase for our permits, um, but it's something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. And thank you very much. Then, and then one last question. I know that we have uh, down on the waterfront residents still have um, a, a free parking. Are we continuing that program? Is that still in, in, in place for people that are listening? Yes. Yeah, so both programs are currently being supported um, with the new system. So the first one is for the city of Monterey residents program. So that one allows for two hours free, seven days a week. And that one is valid in our downtown garages, our waterfront lot and our Cannery Row garage. To be eligible for that one, you do have to be a city of Monterey resident. Um, we have our form online and then we ask for proof of residency, vehicle registration and ID. And then that one is the one that is $20, it's good for one year. The second program we have is for Monterey County um, locals and that one gives two hours free in the waterfront lot Monday through Thursday. And that program is currently being supported through a validation program, which is being um, administered by the wharf merchants. So the wharf, if when a customer visits their favorite wharf merchant, they've identified themselves as a local, they receive a validation, which then gives them the two hours free party. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation, Christy. Good job. Thanks. Mayor, if I could jump in here. Council Member Tyler, of course. Yeah, so I, I just kind of wanted to extend my my appreciation. It, this is um, it was a great uh, presentation and uh, an update. Uh, I particularly appreciated it, you know all the work that's being done to update the technology, updating the meters, um, the work done to to change rates, which included a lot of discussions with the business community and residents, um, uh, the restructure. And then, of course, you added in there beautifully the support that you all provided for the recovery um, due to COVID. So a lot of work going on in, in your office there. And I just wanted to give you a lot of appreciation to you and your team. Um, uh, a couple of the questions that I had were already answered. But one, I was hoping you could go back to this slide that showed the dots with the, the it was about the meters. Um, sure. It had a map with a different colored dots on it. And I was just hoping you could describe what those different colored dots represented. So those dots are each individual meter. And so they're mapped out. So they now have that, they're now on our GIS. Um, it's real time data. Um, it, it allows us to, like for example, in this picture, everywhere that you see a little red meter head inside the colored circle, that is an unpaid meter. Every meter that is green is a paid meter. The color coding on it is identifying the zone so that whether it's a two hour meter, four hour meter, whether it's in zone one, two or three. So they're color coded and then they also have the real time information. And then you can sort the information. Um, you can look at a specific meter and see the real time revenue. You can see the lifetime revenue on that. And you can also sort it all to um, look at it by zone as well. So this is something that we're currently working on how to make that information public facing as well. I love that. So can you tell if a car is parked there by this at all? 
I can only tell if the meter is paid or not paid. Okay. So it, it would it would only show red or green. And um, and and would this allow us to adjust the rates over time to help support you know allow creating more parking in certain areas to the flows? I, yeah, absolutely. I think the data that we get from that will start creating that information and, and we'll be able to see those trends and where the demand is. And that's one of the reasons we set up that zone based pricing so that the meters closer to the water are more expensive. That time frame is shorter and that is to um, ensure space availability and turnover. And then the longer term meters, the four hour meters are the ones that are on foam and wave. And then those ones have a lower rate. So we are trying to get people to park further away and have those closer spaces have that higher turnover. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Or as council member Allen pointed out, if you, if you have higher rates on the street and people are in a restaurant, you want them in the parking garage. Yes. Right. All right, anyone else? We'll go to the public. Any public comment, Nat? We have uh, one raised hand and uh, we'll go ahead and allow them to speak. All right. And uh, they've called in by telephone, so we ask them to please dial star six to unmute themselves. Hi, uh, this is Nina Beatty. I have one question on the uh, license plate reading technology. Um, what does it consist of? How does it read the license plates? Thank you. Great, thank you, Nina. Um, the ozones are infrared cameras. They, uh, they use the red and white lights to read the license plate. Okay, and that concludes public comment. All right, well, once again, we, uh, we thank you so much. We look forward to studying those slides in more detail. And it, you just did a great job sharing with us today. And I, I'm sure the public enjoyed that as well. So we'll go to uh, public comments. Anything not on the agenda within the jurisdiction of the city of Monterey, this is your opportunity to share with us. So we'll take a moment, open it up, and see who'd like to share some thoughts about non-agenda items this evening. For non-agenda items, I don't see any hands raised, Mayor Riverson. Okay. Thank you for that. We'll go to consent. Item uh, three has been requested to be pulled by uh, Ms. Beatty. So we will pull that and have a, a uh, we'll answer a question. I don't know if we should, we'll have a presentation, but I think we'll, what we'll do is ask her to uh, define what her question would be. Then we can answer it for her. Other than that, any council comments or questions on the consent? Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I have one. Member Ed. On item six, uh, because mm -hmm. my business is located within the district of the Old Monterey Business Association, when there's a vote for the consent on item six, I'll uh, recuse myself from that particular uh, subset of the motion. Okay, so we will ask uh, our outstanding city clerk to make a note of that, that on the consent, there'll be an abstention on number six for council member Ed. Thank you. Okay. Mayor, I'll go ahead and uh, move approval of the consent agenda minus item three, I think is what was being pulled. Second. Okay. And we have a second and we need to see any, is there any public comment out there on the consent other than number three that we know of now? Not that we know of, no. Okay, good. Then let's have roll call, please. Council member Hoffa? Yes. Council member Albert? Yes. Council member Smith? Yes. Council member Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. So the motion passes 5-0 with council member Ed abstaining on number six. Oh, so if uh, we could ask Ms. Beatty to join us, we'd very much like to hear uh, what <clears throat> her comment is on our uh, minutes of April 6th. Great, and uh, let me Pull that up here and uh, Ms. Beatty will be allowed to speak and welcome back, Ms. Beatty. If you could please, yep, there we go. Great, <clears throat> on the uh, agenda, the minutes of the agenda, there was no mention of the content of public comments, um, which are important for the public record. Um, in the last year, the public's access to public meetings and officials has been really shut down through the whole COVID situation. 
And um, I request that the city go back to putting the content, a summary of the content of public comments um, in the record um, so that there's a record, there's a public record of what happened during the meeting so that issues that show up meeting after meeting after meeting um, can be seen by anyone who wants to do research because otherwise um, issues that are can be very critical to the city and to the public can be just avoided. Um, so that's my request. Um, I, when I looked at these minutes, I thought this is just not, it's not gonna cut it. We've already had so much access denied please don't deny our access as far as being able to comment into the record. Thank you. All right, was there anyone else who wanted to uh, address us on that? And I'm pulling up the list and uh, we do not have anyone else who would like to address us. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of April 6, 2021. I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and second. And Mayor, if I could too, just say that uh, all the, our meetings are recorded, and so there's always going to be a public document um, verbatim as opposed to something being transcribed that may be missing some of the details that might be relevant. So I just wanted to ensure the public that all the public record is available. Uh, thank you for that reassurance. So we had a motion and a second. If there's no other comment, uh, roll call, please. Yes, Council Member Albert. Yes. Council Member Hoffa. Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Uh, yes. Before we adjourn to closed session, we would invite anyone in the public who wanted to make a comment about our any closed session item to take advantage of that. And this would be your opportunity to do so. And uh, we, we have... Uh... Let's let's take a look uh, here, Mr. Mayor. We have uh, Paul Bowker. Should we go ahead and uh, take that? Yes. So let's. Uh, we'll welcome his comment. Okay, Mr. Bowker, welcome to the meeting. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, thanks for having me. This is Paul. Mm -hmm. How are you guys doing? Um, I just uh, wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I've been uh, running a, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I just wanna introduce myself and uh, say hello. I've been running uh, the charter operations on concession 21 and uh, it's been a privilege and I'm really excited uh, to continue doing so. So thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, my matter being put onto the city council agenda. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that concludes public comment. Well, with that, we will adjourn to our. So good. I'm like so traumatized. I cannot stop shaking. I can feel myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll adjourn to a very close session. I thought I was in trouble for a minute. <laughs> we'll adjourn to a closed session. <laughs>
and welcome back to our city council meeting. Uh, we're very uh, pleased that those uh, in the public are able to join us. We're honored and privileged to have some of your time this evening. And so let's get right ahead to opening our evening session and we're, we're going to ask our magnificent city clerk to show us the flag and we'll do the pledge as soon as we see it. There is Colton Hall on our flag. So please join me in the pledge, everyone. All right, pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America. America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thank you. So uh, magnific magnificent uh, Clementine Bonner Klein, would you introduce uh, the Caring City Council, please? Yes, Council Member Albert. Here. Council Member Hoffa. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Council Member Williamson. Here. And Mayor Roberson. And I'm here. Uh, this is continued public comment. So for those of you who would like to join us and tell us what you're thinking about any items not on the agenda, we ask that you wait until if you have comments about agenda item, we will gladly hear you at that time. And also please within the jurisdiction of Monterey. Uh, Nat, would you wanna give a, just a short reminder of the, I think there's two ways people can join us, Zoom and phone call, please. Yep, there's, there's Zoom and phone call and to join by Zoom, you can download the app or uh, go to Zoom on your computer. To join by telephone, we ask that folks call the toll-free number, which is 833-568-8864 and then enter the meeting ID, which is 160-772-9333 pound, and then press pound one more time when prompted to enter a participant ID. All the instructions on how to join our meetings are online on our website at montre.org. And for those who are calling in, please dial star nine to unmute yourself and then dial star six uh, to, I'm sorry, star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. And uh, we'll also have a timer as we normally do for the meetings as well. And uh, we always like to share that this meeting is also being streamed live on YouTube with a 10 second delay and on Comcast channel 25 with a 90 second delay. Th those are the instructions, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. So do we have any folks who uh, want to share public comments not on the agenda tonight? We do. And uh, we have uh, two folks who've joined by telephone and we'll start with uh, last three digits of 705. And if you could please dial star six to unmute yourself and we will start the timer. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Robertson and city council members. I'm Lorna Moffitt and our wild horses and burrows are nearing extinction due to the corrupt lies of the BLM. The white papers produced by R.T. Finch's group did an extensive investigation of BLM records at their own ex cost and expense and hired helicopters and flew over the holding areas to count the wild horses and burros in captivity and on so-called pasture lands. The numbers were shockingly contrary. Former Congressman Farr wrote a letter to the U.S. Attorney General asking for an investigation into BLM selling 1,700 wild horses to slaughter illegally under the Obama and Vilasak presidency. Thousands of us wrote in to no avail. We were all ignored. The greatness of our country is its wildlife and natural places. It's not about Americans eating burgers all day long. Senator Patella and Congressman Panetta have ignored our inquiries and suggestions suggestions to use wild horses and burros for fuel reduction in forests. 50,000 wild horses in holding that could be released to consume thousands of acres of fuel fire loaded forest. Captain Bill Simpson of Wairika, California has a 500 acre ranch that was saved from fire 
because of his 200 wild horses that kept down the grasses. The local fire chief verified this. And you can see his um, website, which is wildhorsefirebrigade.org, and you can Google that. And he has a proposal which we presented to Congressman Panetta last year, but so far nothing has happened. In fact, my calls lately are being ignored, and I wonder why. There are reasons besides drought that we have fire. The deer, horses, girls, elk, and all other herbivores have plummeted in numbers in California by the millions due to disease and overhunting, fires, logging, etc. So uh, Assemblyman Riva has introduced a resolution to the state assembly that would stop wild horse roundups in California. And that is so huge. So I hope that you also will support that um, that amendment. And in final closing, I encourage everyone to do what they can to boycott Chinese products. The Chinese government has become too aggressive. They have destroyed Tibet, and they now threaten nuclear war if we intervene with Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moffitt. Our next caller is uh, area code 775 and uh, the last three digits of seven, I'm sorry, 484. If you could please unmute yourself by dialing star six. Yes. Um, okay, thank you for hearing me. Um, yeah, I'm very concerned. I, I'm a wildlife ecologist that is pro the wild horses and burrows, and they're uh, my, one of my specialties in my career. Um, I believe. Well, I'm just very upset about the current situation where they're being um, lied about and the um, law that uh, Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burrows Act is now uh, should be celebrating its 50th anniversary um, has been so subverted uh, all these years. It's time to restore this law. So I, I believe that... Um, getting people to restore wild naturally living horses and burrows in America together with their viable habitats and at truly viable population levels is essential today if America is to pull out of its destructive vortex of selfish and greedy materialistic speciesism. Speciesism means only considering one's own species as important and regarding the rest of all, all uh, as all being here merely as things or objects to be used and abused or gotten rid of according to people's selfish wants or whims. This is no right and moral way and it is leading to the destruction of all life on earth. All life on earth is really one united family that has taken millions of years to establish itself on this planet, to destroy this for a relatively few years of materialistic indulgence is immoral beyond belief. It is a cardinal sin. The Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act of 1971 was passed 50 years ago, and it should now be celebrating, not lamenting what has happened with America's magnificent wild naturally living horses and burrows. But unless we change the present state of affairs, this noble and life enhancing law shall have failed. We cannot allow this to happen. We can make a turnaround and restore the true intent of this greatly goodwilled and beautiful act, but we ourselves must act if we are to save and restore the, the wild horses and burrows, a healthy and balanced life community and the human race itself. Those of us, us who still possess a conscience that is alive and well have living within an inspired attuned vision. This is for this whole and great family of life, not man apart. We have a sense I'm, for I'm sorry, truly but, um, the three, three minute time limit has uh, has ended oh. and um, appreciate you yeah. calling in, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, we're going to go ahead and go to the um, the next caller here. And um, this is six five zero is the area code and three six six are the last three digits. 
Hi, welcome to our Hi. council meeting. Uh, thank you. This is Jean Rash, uh, resident of Monterey in the Monterey Vista neighborhood. I'm calling to again ask that some of the city's American Rescue Plan 6.7 million be used to um, deal with the uh, highway encampment issues, all of the encampment issues. Bill and I drove up to um, Home Depot on Saturday, first time back in Home Depot, and on the drive home, I almost threw up. There are encampments about every 50 feet along the highway. And there's two ways to look at this. One is from the homeless people to think that we are a society that allows people to live in, in this squalor is so upsetting. The other way to look at it is from the residents um, the, and from the public point of view, we, we are normalizing this they, you should be flooded with calls every time you meet. This is totally unacceptable that these conditions are allowed. You can take some of the rescue money. You can buy hotel vouchers, have the homeless live in there temporarily while the camps are cleaned up, and you then put them into permanent housing. And however way the county and the state and the cities do this, it has got to be done. People. People cannot keep looking at this and living this way. We have a remarkable erosion of the on-ramps. You know they're living without sanitation. There's no potable water. There's nothing, nothing that could ever be permitted about this whole situation. And now you're taking on the liability of fire risk as we face the season with all this dead wood around. It's just, just intolerable, and um, you got to do something. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, that concludes public comment for items not on today's agenda. All right, thank you. As always, we appreciate people phoning in and sharing their concerns and thoughts with us. Uh, announcements from closed session. Yes, um, so for item, closed session item one, which was a conference with real property negotiators regarding the property at 78 Fisherman's Wharf, concession 21, with agency negotiators Kimberly Cole and Jana Aldretti, and the negotiating party Anthony Rafa. And under negotiation were terms and conditions for consent to assignment of sublease. There was a unanimous roll call vote from the city council uh, to give confidential direction to their property negotiators. For the closed session item number two, um, which was a workers comp um, conference regarding um, Pedro Becerra Marquez versus the city of Monterey um, regarding existing litigation. Um, the city council gave a unanimous roll call vote to give confidential direction to their legal counsel. And then items three and four uh, were not heard. Three was not heard, but I believe four may be heard later this evening. Yes. <clears throat> if I got that wrong about four, please correct me, but that no, was that's, my, my that, That's all correct. All right, so we'll go to our uh, public hearing this evening. <clears throat> and this is a recommendation that the council adopt an annual action plan for community development block grant funds, otherwise known as CDBG grant funds, that uh, come to the city from the federal government and so momentarily we'll hear a presentation. We do have a five-year plan for use of CDBG funds. And each year we adopt an action plan for that year. And I think it, once I turn it over to the city manager, I think uh, we're looking at CDBG and also other housing funds within the city. And I think he's going to explain the difference uh, of sources for that. So without further ado, the Planning Commission has reviewed that it's my understanding and recommends it to us. We'll turn it over to our magnanimous city manager, Hans Usler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, yes, as you stated, uh, the city of Monterey mm -hmm. is in a, a very, very well uh, uh, position uh, as we have uh, CDBG funding that is uh, given to us on an annual basis uh, by the federal government. Community Development Block Grants is uh, the abbreviation is CDBG. 
as well as uh, we have uh, housing program funds, which are basically uh, created through our uh, various uh, housing properties that we have spread throughout the city. And there are various types of, of uh, um, funding mechanism, uh, for instance, the, 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 the uh, Hotel Pacific, uh, that is a hotel that is on Pacific Street vis-a-vis uh, -vis our conference center. That building is built on, on, on city grounds and we have an agreement with uh, the Hotel Pacific to, to reimbursement on an annual basis for, for that um, uh, ground that they are uh, getting from us in addition, of course, to the TOT that they are paying to us. Um, and so there are a variety of uh, arrangements, business deals uh, that allow us to have additional housing program income. Uh, and uh, of that is um, uh, that brings in per year something like 900,000 to $1.1 million. This is a fluctuating number. Uh, we, we try to give you the best estimate, but sometimes um, properties uh, that, that are deed restricted and are owned by us are being sold. They can create, uh, add to the housing program income. Uh, so what we do at, the, at this time of the year, we, we, we present to you uh, our best estimate of the budget, but we also are able to talk to you about how we think it makes the greatest sense in distributing those funds um, for the next year. And there's a long process or a longer process, so to speak, that started in November. And uh, there's, it's very formalized and very rigid in order to be compliant with all the federal regulations. And we are now at the point that we can present to you uh, what we have so far uh, collected as input and what we propose uh, going forward. And with that, I hand it over to uh, our community development director, Kimberly Cole. Um, thank you very much, Hans. Um, I will be sharing the screen and hopefully Grant Leonard can unmute himself. Great. And he will be giving the presentation this evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, before we start the presentation, I just want to explain that Kim is handling the slides because my power went out in Castroville about 10 minutes before the Council meeting, which uh -huh. was too short of a time for me to drive back to the office. So mm -hmm. um, we're making it work and I appreciate Kim's assistance on this. Uh, so as uh, has been discussed, this is the public hearing to accept our annual action plan for community development block grants. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, so what is CDBG and why is it important? Um, well, it's a federal grant we receive every year, and it is um, a great way to support local uh, uh, community projects, such as the Youth Homeless Shelter on Pearl Street, which we were able to provide significant amount of funding to repair and re uh, rehabilitate so that continue, can, can continue to serve homeless youth in uh, the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, CDBG also is a great source for things like repairing uh, neighborhood parks, um, providing public service grants, and supporting affordable housing, which is what we'll uh, discuss shortly. As Han mentioned, this is um, part of a five-year action plan. And this is one year of it, and we focus on four major areas, on public service grants to local nonprofits. And we'll discuss the 12 that applied for funding this year. Infrastructure improvements, uh, typically for nonprofits, um, for buildings they own, but can also go for community projects. In the past, we've used them for city park improvements. Housing preservation is a category that includes things like our Mr. Fix-It Home Repair Grant Program, but also our Purchase and Resale Program, which Hans had mentioned is uh, when the city has a deed restricted property that is then resold to a first time home buyer who's low income. And we also use the funding to plan and provide good administration for the program and for housing development, affordable housing development within the city. Certain um, categories do have funding restrictions. Um, so administration is limited to 20% of our total budget and the nonprofit grants are limited to 15%. So our uh, 
grant we're going to receive from the federal government next year is $260,000. That's our direct entitlement. But as Hans mentioned, we do have a significant amount of program income, um, which is a much larger share of our funding pie than the actual grant from the federal government. Uh, so that's a big kudos to the city for having successfully invested housing funds over the decades, and those are now paying dividends. As I mentioned, our nonprofit service grants, uh, we serve a lot of different types of nonprofits, everything from food bank to fair housing and legal services for seniors or um, court appointed special advocates for youth. Uh, so as long as these agencies are benefiting the residents of the city of Monterey, they are eligible for funding under this program. This year we received 12 applications and you see their funding request is next to each uh, agency. We received one new agency applying, that's the Covia Home Match Program. In total, the agency has requested $234,000. Now, as I mentioned, this program is limited to 15% of our total budget. So the maximum we were able to allocate this year is $172,000. Uh, so as you can see, most people received a portion of what they requested. Covia, as a new applicant, received a smaller portion of their grant. This is sort of a prove it year for them to see if their program can be established and then come back for further assistance in future years. One agency which the city is traditionally funded is the Salvation Army. However, this year they requested funds for rental assistance. The application was done in November before we knew that we'd be receiving funds from the county and the federal government. The Salvation Army has since received a significant amount of funding for that program, as has the city of Monterey for our own emergency rental assistance program. As such, uh, to fund it through this program would be duplicative, would be redundant, and therefore it's not been recommended for funding. This year for our public infrastructure grants, we received two applications. One was recommended, one was not. A Veterans Transition Center requested funding to continue to repair duplexes on the former Ford Ord which will be used as transitional housing for homeless veterans. Meals on Wheels of the Monterey Peninsula requested funding to improve their outdoor space at the Sally Griffin Center in Pacific Grove. However, uh, this would be a duplication of services provided by the city from our own senior center at the Schulze Center. Uh, so that program was, or that project was not recommended for funding. Housing preservation, as I mentioned, this includes our Mr. Fix-It program, our home accessibility program, our home safety program, and our major loan program for low-income homeowners, as well as our purchase and resale program for first-time homebuyers. And this budget is uh, the largest share of our program, uh, but it also contains uh, the priciest items which is the purchase and resale program to ensure that our housing stock is maintained. Finally, our planning administration includes monitoring and technical assistance for our grantees, uh, outreach to identify new affordable housing projects and homeless services, and our continued collaboration on regional homeless programs and affordable housing initiatives. We did begin this process in November and grant applications were due in December. Uh, we then had a public meeting in January. We released the draft document in March and had a planning commission hearing in March. And tonight we're having our public hearing to adopt it at city council. Following this, it will be submitted to the Department of Housing and Urban Development by May 15th. And in the next fiscal year, we'll begin delivering projects. 
One final item, which I neglected to include in this presentation, is we're also considering a substantial amendment to two prior year program years for our community development block grants. This is to address uh, minor technical corrections related to our past emergency rental assistance program, simply to ensure that we update our program guidelines so that they're following all of HUD's requirements related to emergency rental assistance. And that information was detailed in your staff report. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Grant. Uh, very nice presentation under the circumstances and we hope you get your power back soon. Uh, questions at this point before we go to the public? Council Member Allen, please, then Council Member Ed. Yeah, thank you for that presentation, Grant. Um, I'm wondering about Casa de Noche Buena, which is the um, recently opened homeless shelter for women and families on the Monterey Peninsula. And I think we allocated basically the homeless challenge grant of $21 per resident this past year for them. If council wanted to include that in this, um, in this budget, is that something we could do if we reallocated some money from one of the other budget items? Uh, so excellent point. And I neglected to mention that in our slide about the public service grantees. But Community Homeless Services did provide two applications this year, one for their homeless outreach at Safe Place and one for their homeless work, homeless outreach at Casa de Notre Buena. Both applications are recommended for funding within that 172,000. Okay, Alan, that answers your question. He said that's being funded. And I, think, looks, I think so. Um, maybe if the city manager could clarify. Yeah, I, I think uh, that that is uh, funded for the $29,000 for Casa de Nocha Buena and the remainder goes to the safe place. So that's community human services, number three? Yes, that's uh, number three, yeah. That's included in number three. Good catch, Thank Alan. You for Thank the you. clarification, Grant. Yeah, very good. And Council Member Ed? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Grant, thank you for your presentation. I know that this is one of those uh, documents that has many constraints. This is the five year plan that we have to, we go through this each year in, in an amendment. Um, I'm interested in looking at the breakdown of the housing preservation program. I know it's a total of 677,000, but do we know what a figure is that would be designated in the what's our history for the fix it program what have we been typically uh, being able to cover with the fix it program yes absolutely um mr fix it is a grant program that's funded for thirty-five thousand dollars each year home accessibility grant is a, also funded at thirty-five thousand dollars each year and the home safety grant is funded at thirty-five thousand for a total of a hundred and five thousand in grants for low-income homeowners for home repair okay and and i assume the balance of that available funding is what's set aside for uh down payment uh assistance uh, for low income uh correct mostly for our first-time home buyer program yeah and the uh preservation program so when a affordable unit comes up for resale occasionally the city may have to buy it that can be $150,000, $200,000 for one condo, for instance. Uh, so yeah. uh, we need to have a large share of our budget uh, reserved for those units so we can keep them preserved and continue to be affordable. Okay, great. And I know we're talking about funds for the next fiscal year, but if someone felt that they were qualified for the Mr. Fix-It program, uh, where would you direct uh, our citizens so that they might be able to uh, take advantage of some emergency repairs under that program. What's their first step? Uh, the first step is contact the housing office, either at our phone number or our website. Uh, okay. We have a page dedicated for this program and the online application is available there as well. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And I just, uh, I know that there's never enough money to go around to uh, many 
of the great causes we have and our nonprofit partners. Um, I know that we have restrictions, um, that it's based on the amount of income that's coming in from uh, the block grants. Uh, if we ever were to have um, spare coins that fell out of the parking meters in the old days under the, under the carpet, I'd say the money I think is, uh, is more needed in the Mr. Fix-It program because I think that we almost always go through that and we have more applicants than we're able to accommodate. So uh, I'm always looking at opportunities that that might be able to be expanded to keep people in their homes, uh, update their homes uh, as we have an aging population to certainly pay attention to the safety and, and home ownership and keep people in their homes as long as they can. And if a Mr. Fix-It program could be ex expanded in any way, I, I think that that's my higher, higher priority for anything. Got it. That's all Thank I had, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Let's concentrate on questions at this point. And uh, Council Member Tyler. Um, when does the, uh, the, the rental assistance funding from the feds um, expire or, or when do we have to use that by? So our funding through the United Way and County is uh, required to be fully expended by December 31st of this year. Okay, so so basically we won't have a program starting January 1 to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, well, we do have um, a portion of our PLHA grant, our Permanent Local Housing Allocation Grant, that is dedicated to rental assistance. Uh, but it's a much smaller portion than what we currently have. Uh, currently, we have 1.2 million from the county. Uh, our PHLA grant is about $35,000. So that's more of a, a very emergency rental assistance type of program, whereas now we're in um, a much larger COVID-19 response. Would it be possible to hold those funds um, until after the December 31 deadline for the use of the initial funding? So that way we have something that can get us through the end of the fiscal year? Uh, yes, that would be our approach. Okay, uh, preferably, uh, obviously. Um, uh, and then okay. can I just add one thing to that? Grant, can you explain that if the city was to allocate additional funding for emergency rental assistance, which pot of money that's required to come out of? Uh, yes, so um, for the emergency rental assistance from the county, that's its own pot of money. Um, for the PHLA, it's its own separate account. If the emergency rental assistance were to be funded by community development block grants, it would go in our public service category, and which we're already at our limit of 15% for that $172,000. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, and can we also briefly address the timeliness of spending as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, HUD requires that we expend a majority of our grant and our program income by May 1st of each year. Um, so it's very advantageous for us to have projects like the home repair program or the public infrastructure and the public service grants who report quarterly uh, so that we can be sure we spend down our funding uh, by that May 1st timeliness test. If we do not spend down the majority of our funds by then, uh, it's a big red flag when we get audited by HUD every year. And, and we are jeopardizing future funding. And, and I, I'm not saying this as, a, as an empty threat. We were actually in, in, in that part of jeopardy uh, a few years back, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. So I just um, want to repeat, so if, we did fund emergency rental assistance. It would take away from the public service grants offered to our various nonprofits. And that's a, um, a regulation established by a, um, HUD. It's a regulate, what do you mean it's a regulate, just as our limit of how much funding we get or, or taking it away from another organization? So we can spend 15% towards public service. I see. I and see. emergency rental assistance is classified as that. I got you. Okay, and then I I also see um, uh, 
uh, Covia on here, which I'm I'm super happy to see that included. Was that the full mount that they requested? Uh, no, they had requested um, twenty thousand uh, dollars, but our grant review committee, which is uh, consists of representatives from the planning commission, the police department, and um, the community development department reviewed and ranked the applications and they felt as a first time applicant, uh, Covia shouldn't get their full amount, uh, but instead a portion of it. So they just got uh, 5,000 instead of the 20,000 they requested. And um, the review committee felt uh, the majority of the funds should go to uh, projects related to homelessness and food insecurity. Yeah. Uh, so that's why those grantees received uh, a larger allocation. No, obviously we all wish there was more money to be able to go around. There's a lot of good stuff happening in our community. So I, I appreciate the process that um, has unfolded. And I know I asked this, I believe it was last year, but just for clarification's sake, regarding our effort to develop 100% affordable housing on, at these opportunity sites in downtown, how does that work in regards to our potential utilization of some of these funds if it were to be helpful in support of us reaching that goal? Yeah, so um, CDBG funding, community development block grants, interestingly cannot be used to build new affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it can be used to prepare a site for affordable housing. So if you think of all the work that's done horizontally, like demolition or bringing utilities to the site or sidewalk improvements, uh, the city could use its block grant funding for that in the future. Uh, but the city could not use block grants to actually uh, help the developer build a new building. Um, those four sites are not currently ready for development. We're still at the very early process of that. Um, so that's something for the city to consider in future years of our block grant process. Absolutely. Okay, I think that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Very Mayor. good, great questions. Council Member Dan? Thank you. Uh, Kim, could you put up the slide that has the Veterans uh, Transition Center? I wanted to see that. I think I, I might have read that incorrectly. I just wanted to look at it for a second. Here. Yeah, is um, the Meals and Wheels is not recommended, but is it because we're giving them 15,000 15, in the other uh, funding source? Um, so the reason Meals on Wheels is not recommended is because uh, the city has its own senior center. Yeah. And so to fund a capital improvement at a senior center in another city uh, would be prohibited by HUD regulations. I see. Uh, we can fund their service request for delivering meals because those meals are being delivered within the city. And that was the 15,000 we were talking about. Correct. Okay. And then Alan, I, I just wanted to ask the question about Casa de uh, Noche Buena. Was that the amount of, of dollars of funding you were looking at? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure. So Grant, it sounds like probably has better information, but but there is, you know, we've got Safe Place for the youth and then yeah. there's Casa de Noche Buena. And I think in the past we've maybe given Safe Place, you know, 10 to 15,000. Mm -hmm. And so this is a bigger number which I think reflects the fact that there's now two different shelters. So my assumption is this is what um, CHS was looking for, so. Okay, that, that's all my questions. Thank you, thank you, Alan. All right, excellent questions and very fine answers, Grant. Very, very good. So let's go to the public, please, Nat. Uh, let's see if we have some public comment. Yes, we do. And uh, we have Esther Malkin, who has uh, raised her hand and will allow her to speak. Welcome, All right. Esther. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I just have a question about um, this other grant that I, for some reason, don't recall hearing about before this DLHA, I think it was called. Um, I'm going to assume that it also carries the um, HUD restrictions that the rental assistance programs that we've had um, does, but if that's not the case, I'd like to know about it. Um, because we are, you know, in the process of opening up again, the city, and I'm sure you guys have heard um, that there's a lot of help wanted need out there mm -hmm. by restaurants and businesses. And 
part of the reason for that is because so many of the renters left um, that couldn't afford that couldn't qualify for the renter assistance program that we've had because the HUD parameters are not very realistic. And so I want to caution you for, you know, against not thinking about establishing a standalone renter assistance program that would not have these HUD restrictions because when the eviction moratorium lifts and as well as um, foreclosures start happening, the group of people that are going to become homeless are the people that never had access to help by the HUD parameters. And, you know, unless you're already impoverished, HUD basically doesn't help you. And so the people who haven't had access to any help are not going to have anywhere to go other than the streets or leave. And we've already seen a lot leave. And I don't know how much you guys think the city can function with the limited amount of staff. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to bring up. And also, how, how are we going to start adding more properties to the deed restricted program? Because to my recollection, the last one that I've heard about was Jason Asmus. And before that, there wasn't much that was happening either. And that's a program that's really important, but I don't see it actively getting more inventory added to it. Um, so I, I would like to know more about what the plan is for that program. And um, lastly, I don't recall seeing. Um, public uh, notice about a meeting for public input on this in January. Um, that's probably due to the fact that everything was, I mean, anyone who was paying attention um, that early was prepping for COVID. But um, the year before, I know that a lot of us um, attended the, the meeting and this year we didn't, um, I didn't hear about it. So just wanted to bring that up. Thanks. Thank you, Esther. And we do not have any other public comment. So back okay. there. We'll bring it back to the council. Uh, we had a couple questions from our friend Esther. Uh, are we able to answer those tonight or can we get back yeah. to her? No, I think we can answer those questions. I, I, I give it a prompt it over to Grant. Uh, uh, all those questions, I think we have answers. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, so the permanent local housing allocation, uh, the good news is it does not follow HUD rules. Uh, the bad news is it follows the California Department of Housing and Community Development rules, which can be equally complex and restrictive. Um, we haven't spent a great deal of time with that funding yet because we had our community development block grants for rental assistance. And now we have the federal money through the county. Um, so uh, that's something we'll be working on once we exhaust the United Way funding, uh, but it will be uh, subject to the restrictions of the California Department of Housing and Community Development. The question of how we add new um, deed restricted properties, uh, that is done through primarily development when new projects are developed within the city. The city's inclusionary housing policy requires that 20% of them be deed restricted. Uh, so that includes new apartments, such as 595 Moonross across from Trader Joe's. Two of those 10 apartments are deed restricted. And it also includes ownership, um, such as uh, the condominium conversion at 820 Casanova Avenue, or our single family homes at Laguna Grande Court. So to add new uh, deed restricted units through development uh, requires development. And Grant, can, can I just add to that? Um, the major impediment right now to new residential construction is the lack of water supply. And I think the council is aware that our most significant opportunity to add additional housing is most likely along Garden Road that will require formal exceptions to the cease and desist order from the state of California. And we are pursuing that individually as a city, as well as regionally with the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District. So I think it's important to realize that the impediment to new housing development 
is not necessarily zoning, but it is the lack of water supply that we don't have additional water for the construction to happen. Exactly. Um, if, if I, uh, Grant, I apologize if to interrupt you, but also I think an element that uh, Esther wanted to know from us is also um, how many deed restricted units have we sold to uh, income disadvantaged uh, new house owners? And I think that was included in Esther's question. And if you could state how many units we sold last year, because that number is 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 greater than one and and smaller than six, I believe. Uh, yes. So of the existing affordable ownership units in the city, uh, periodically people move out of them. Uh, they start a family and have to move out of their condo, or they get a job opportunity in another city, or uh, any number of reasons why people choose to move from their home. Uh, when that happens, uh, because it's deed restricted, the home has to be sold to somebody who's uh, low income and on the city's first time home buyer list. And last year, um, for a variety of reasons, um, we had uh, eight condominiums and, and single family homes, two single family homes, six condominiums that had people move out of them. And we were able to resell them to people off of our wait list. Okay, and so, so again, the, these were eight units we sold uh, last year to uh, folks uh, at um, deed restricted units with little to zero down. Exactly. Yes, a lot of those units were generated in the 1980s and 90s when there was really a, a, an apartment condo housing boom in the city of Monterey. And we did, we acquired, I think, over 500, has helped me with the 520 deed restricted units, I believe. Exactly, yes. Which is really quite a lot when you think of what a small town that we have. But, and so now people have purchased those, have kept them, obviously. Uh, but then they are sold. And what I go down to the title company. Uh, about once or twice a year and actually do sign the title papers on behalf of the city. And we're looking at people being able to buy a unit anywhere from 200 to maybe $350,000, which is practically unheard of. And they are pre-qualified. And I must tell you, they are so ecstatic and happy that they just can't contain themselves uh, with the amount of gratitude that they have for these units. And it would be great if we could get more. Yes, Dan. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, how many um, how many citizens do we have on that uh, the wait list? Uh, so it is uh, actually three wait lists. It's by bedroom size. So studio in one bedroom is one list. Uh, two bedroom is another list. And three bedroom for families is a third list. And between the three lists, we have about 55 uh, individuals and families. Uh, that increased last January when we did a uh, public relations uh, push for the program and we got a number of new applicants. All right, thank you. Yeah, and, and also um, just from the experience, not everyone on the list is ready then to, to purchase. So we, right. we go in the order uh, that we have received the applications and sometimes the first six or uh, eight say, we, we're not ready for this, or we don't want to do it for a variety of reasons. So uh, that's why we did the push last year to get people on the wait list so we can seamlessly um, re resell those units. And last but not least, um, council, please be aware, this is a zero sum, zero sum game that we are looking at. So we explained the CDBG fund, we have explained the housing program fund. If you decide, uh, and, and you have, uh, and we together have a multitude of, of uh, ideas how to spend the money. Um, but if you see that uh, two bedroom, one bath in, uh, in a condominium complex, let's say on Glenwood Circle, goes anywhere. If you look at uh, 200 Glenwood Circle, 300, or, or uh, what's the other number, 600, I believe, those units go anywhere between 350 to $500,000 now. So. Uh, if you look at the income that we have uh, and and the way we are spending it, um, we we need to find ways in balancing that. So if the council 
also wants to one year decide, okay, let's add uh, inventory to our uh, area. Let's do it. Another way that we can, that we have looked at uh, a couple of times is sell a high price, uh, sell a high priced unit here and there and see if we have other targets of opportunities where we could maybe buy um, duplex or a quad, quad, quadplex and, and, and pool the money and buy more. However, as you know, housing prices right now are so ridiculously high uh, that those plans have to be put on shelf right now. Mayor, can I, um, can I entertain a motion to adopt the 2021-22 annual action plan for the C CDBG funds? And I'll Thank second you. that. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Council Member Tyler? Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to follow up on some of the questions that I was asking to make kind of close the, the loop on, on maybe why I was getting around to some of the specifics. So regarding COVIA, um, it's such a wonderful housing program that looks at matching um, up individuals looking for a home with those that with those who may not traditionally rent room in their home um, or on their property. So I think it's a great opportunity to, in a way, or if you will, increase housing stock. Um, and a lot of their target audience are seniors that maybe are widowed and they just have extra rooms in the house and it's an opportunity to maybe get some extra help around the house and create a, a, an affordable rent for somebody in the community so it's a great program i, I respect the process that um, staff came up with that but i'm i'm just kind of pushing this in a public space um, because i think if we don't support the funding um, support the, the funding requests or at least to a larger extent um, we'll, we'll lose this service opportunity in, in our communities um, when I believe it can create measurable opportunities for our, our vulnerable populations. Um, and then the opportunity sites, um, we just may want to think about um, how we can prioritize CDBG funds um, for that if necessary. Um, we should be pulling all necessary levers to, to make sure that the vision uh, this vision that we see uh, comes to, to fruition. So um, of course we have to see how this goes um, moving forward. And I know there's some work still to be done in this area, but I just kind of putting it out there that you know this is a source of funding that's available to us. And we may wanna be able to leverage that in the future. And then the rental assistance program, um, I mean, we've been talking about this uh, since the pandemic began and it kind of seemed clear that there was a desire to uh, develop something kind of long-term and sustainable. And I understand the need for us to be able to spend down the funding. And so I'm not saying that CDBG is maybe the pot of funding that we use for this. Maybe it is, and we start small and we see that it's something manageable to make sure that we can use all those funds in a given year. Um, but I, I definitely think that this is uh, uh, an essential tool to create safety net for the most vulnerable folks in our community. Um, especially with housing being our top priority. So just kind of wanted to throw that out there, but but I support the uh, staff recommendation and, and I'll vote to support. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Um, yeah, I'm going to support the motion and the staff recommendation. There are always challenges. Um, you know, we have a lot of very worthy programs that are all competing for, unfortunately, a too small pot of money. And, um, and then there are various rules that dictate, mm -hmm. you know, how we divide that money up. So it, it's difficult. Um, regarding the rental assistance program, I think that um, we're covered for most of this year with the grant that we've gotten from the state and the feds. But I'm thinking long term, we want to be thinking about identifying a stable source of funding if the council does move forward with cannabis um, legalization, I think we should consider a portion of that, a certain percentage of that, kind of the way we do for um, neighborhood improvement to be dedicated to this, to this purpose, or perhaps more broadly speaking to this housing program. It's clear we have a lot of needs that exceed our ability to fund with respect to housing and it's clear that this is um 
a serious challenge um, for our city and for our residents. So I think we, we want to be thinking about identifying additional funds that won't impair our general fund and would allow us greater flexibility and ability to fund um, some of these other programs in the future. So um, thank you to staff and, uh, and uh, that's really all I have to say, thank you. Okay, very good. I'm looking on a different computer, I'm not ignoring you all. And we've had a housing snapshot uh, and I think you're familiar with that. Our staff, uh, 2016, 17 and 18, I don't think we've done one for last year, but what it is, it's a summary page, one page long. And if we could produce one uh, this year, it's really helpful when we receive requests about what is the city doing with respect to housing and nonprofits and what are you doing with your federal money and it's it's really a valuable tool i think everyone's seen it and it has spending highlights i can't share it because it's on a different computer and when i use that computer for the meeting you all say i chirp <laughs> and i say that's the computer that's doing that versus me and it identifies funding sources has photos of the community you know, the safe place reopening and public service grants it, it's really a really nice uh, tool for the public and us to have so i would request that we produce one of those for this year again please a roll call council member hoffa yes council member williamson yes council member smith yes council member albert yes and mayor roberson Yes. All right, item 10 is a city manager's update on the COVID-19 response efforts. And I imagine Hans will probably mention a couple of things that uh, orally, but also would remind everyone to look at the city of Monterey's website, monterey.org. And if you haven't signed up for the city of Monterey daily update, I really encourage you to do that. I think it's called the City of Monterey Update. We're at 230 plus at this point, and it was really an excellent summary of what's going out on out there with respect to COVID and CHOMP, the, um, the different programs the city's doing. For example, the food that is provided by the, uh, the food bank and the recreation staff down at Dennis and Menace parking lot distributes food there. It's really a, a huge resource. And also if you take a look at Have Your Say Monterey, which is uh, also on the daily update, you can click on that and you can find a whole lot of information, including what um, Alan was talking about earlier with respect to cannabis and results of the meetings that also have your say Monterey also has the report that we received on sea level rise. So there's some really good resources online and not to mention to leave out Monterey mornings with the city manager. If you haven't caught that, you'll want to be sure to see the star of Monterey Hans Uslar when he shares thoughts and answers questions. So Hans, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can uh, share with you to tonight, we are sending out uh, uh, our regular email number 248. Uh -huh. And uh, frankly, we started counting probably five, six days in uh, when we realized uh, <laughs> it's probably worthwhile counting. All right, uh, so COVID-19 update date, April 20, 2021, 403 days since we declared uh, a local emergency. Uh, this is a mostly good news update council. The sports center swimming pool opened Monday morning. Um, we have also expanded the opening hours for the whole facility. We are now open at 5.30 a.m. Monday through Friday. And on Saturday, we are open at 8 a.m. Uh, to, I believe, 4 p.m. So uh, we have expanded opening hours uh, and Monday morning when we opened the pool at 5.30, we had about 50 folks in line, socially distant, but ready to go swimming. And uh, one of the things that we were able to also do 
by just combining uh, cost savings from, from various budget uh, CIP projects, uh, we uh, redid the whole pool deck. And you see here uh, basically how the new pool deck looks. Uh, it doesn't have any more the uh, loving, uh, lovable purple diamonds from the early 90s. <laughs> uh, it, it is uh, it is built uh, up to spec, and uh, there was no rush in uh, getting this thing uh, built correctly. So we're very hopeful that this will last us for for ten, twelve years now. So um, with that, uh, sports center is is open. Uh, people are coming back, and in the morning hours, it's in the early morning hours, very well frequented. And then there is there are some times I learned today uh, where we're um, one council member felt he was exercising all by himself. So um, uh, again, we are open. We hope people will come back more and more. Uh, today was the day where we opened uh, Dennis the Menace Park. We selected uh, Tuesday for for the opening day because uh, this is is a day that that uh, not a lot of folks will will uh, automatically come to the park. We wanted to see how it works. Um, all the playground equipment you see there. Uh, had to be cleaned and had to be made functional again. And uh, here in the in the foreground is actually a new piece of play equipment that was installed sometime in the middle of 2020 uh, when when it was delivered on time. But unfortunately, as you know, the the playgrounds were all closed. And this is a brand new piece of equipment and um, was uh, actually cherished today by by a bunch of kids. Um, Basketball courts, group picnic, barbecue are reopening. Uh, you need permits still for picnic and barbecue areas, uh, but you can see that uh, people are again playing basketball next to the Coast Guard mm -hmm. or play out basketball in Montecito. Um, it's, it's great to see uh, some uh, normal behavior returning on in, in our parks and our courts. Um, we, we still continue to have blood drives at El Estero. And also, Mr. Mayor, we have uh, outsourced the food drive now to the National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Guard is conducting the food drive with one or two staffers from the uh, uh, Lake El Estero Youth Center helping them. But uh, it's a great partnership with the Food Bank, National Guard, and the city now. Um, we are planning for summer programs, and we have been a traditional employer for many of our high school students and high school graduates, and we are welcoming you back with your applications. Um, please uh, consider working again for the city. You will see how exciting it is to to uh, to work in the various functions that that we are offering. So again, we are posting this on our website, and uh, we are hiring uh, not just in the sports center, but also in other for other programs for the summer. Um, we started a, another campaign that will hopefully help people to uh, get more motivated for vaccinations. We have probably we are probably reaching a point now where uh, vaccinations are available and not as many as uh, as we have vaccinations. People are signing up for that. Uh, there just this night we we uh, engaged on social me media. There are a variety of appointments available this mm -hmm. week uh, at Montage Health uh, out in Marina for, for clinics there as well as in Salinas. So uh, we have vaccines in the county available and we have really a challenge right now of getting enough people out to, that, uh, to those places. So uh, we started a campaign, masks on, sleeves up. And uh, here you see some of our um, uh, employees, firefighters, police officers, and, and Sierra, who works in the police department, also uh, trying to tell folks, hey, go and get your vaccine. It's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, my last part of the presentation, I want to show you a little bit of, of uh, where we stand with vaccinations and infections in the, in the county of Monterey. Um, this is basically our uh, Monterey County, uh, and uh, before I start showing you the slides, these are slides that, that Dr. Moreno uh, allowed me to use. Um, uh, these are basically the county slides, but, but he um, uh, shared, uh, allow, allows me to, to share them with you, and I want to give him and his team the credit for, for making those slides. So this is the seven-day daily uh, COVID-19 case rate per 100,000 resident. 
And when you look at uh, the, the, the timeline between 3.11.2021 and uh, today, what you see is really that that is what we classically call flattening the curve. So you see it's, it's going down now. We are uh, really continuing a trend where the rolling seven-day case uh, load is, is continuing to go into the right direction. Um, what this chart shows you is basically that the testing uh, that, that we have in the county mirrors almost the curve that we have in the state of California. And you see here when, when the state testing numbers go up, the county numbers go up and vice versa, when the state testing numbers go down, we show the same uh, curve of that. So we are mirroring uh, exactly what's happening in, in the state with, with our testing. Uh, as you know, MCCVB, MCHA, as well as the County of uh, Monterey are promoting testing. Uh, testing is still an uh, a absolutely necessary element in keeping the infection uh, at bay and knowing what type of infections we have in the county. And so testing site will continue to be open and, and will continue to be offered. Uh, the big news uh, last week, Monday, was the suspension, suspension of the Johnson & Johnson mm -hmm. vaccine. Uh, the the uh, committee uh, of the FDA that will discuss the future of this vaccine uh, will meet again on Friday, April 23rd. Uh, the reason for that is that there were uh, six or seven outcomes, maybe the number has increased by, by one or two since then, of um, uh, blood clots that had developed in, in, in a very small number of women and that uh, led to a suspension of the use of those vaccines. Um, what the health advisory is that individuals who have received the J&J &J vaccine within the last three weeks, those are the ones that should continue monitoring for severe headache, uh, abdominal pain, leg pain, and shortness of breath. All others who had the Johnson & Johnson prior to the, those three weeks waiting period, they are through with that as I understand the topic. Um, here's, here's the number of doses that the county has given uh, um, throughout this past uh, year, throughout 2021, I apologize, throughout 2021. And you see the curve goes up and then it goes significantly down. And that, that's not that we have a really shortage of, of, of uh, supplies. It, it just is reflective that the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine was taken off the market right now. We have Johnson & Johnson in our refrigerators. Uh, part of those vaccine, part of that contingent is also in the city of Monterey in our refrigerators there. And we really hope we can uh, 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 use that vaccine sooner than later but those numbers that you see right now are reflective of that. Uh, here, here's an interesting chart that tells you what is the percentage of the county uh, of uh, age groups that have received already uh, at least one dose. You see, we just started with the 16 to 17 years old folks. Uh, that's 22% of that, those have already received doses. And when you go at the lower spectrum there, 75 plus, 75% uh, have been vaccinated. 65 to 74, 75% have been vaccinated. So, so those numbers look all good. And of course you see the last ones in uh, are the ones that have the lowest numbers right now. And of course, uh, again, clinics are available and folks should go onto uh, my turn uh, .gov and, and they will find vaccination appointments. They're available right now in, in Marina, but also in Salinas. Um, this gives you an overview where we are uh, across the county. Uh, take note, left-hand side, 57% of the peninsula and Big Sur have been vaccinated. Uh, Salinas, the number is 58%. North County, 74, 47%. South County, 46%. So uh, again, this is, gives you a breakdown by region and um, uh, it shows you Salinas uh, Peninsula almost at par, North County to South County also almost at par there as well on a 46 to respectively 47% level. 
This is what we have here in, in our region uh, on the peninsula, where are the vaccines uh, by, ordered by zip codes uh, 93940, 940 is the city of Monterey, um, 93950 is Pacific Grove, 93955 is a seaside. And if you recall, we had really a, a hotspot of COVID for a long time over on, on the peninsula in seaside. So again, those numbers there are, are lower than, than I would have guessed uh, if I wouldn't have seen the data. So um, we, we, we need to jointly work that we uh, continue to reach out to folks and, and uh, offer clinics here on the peninsula. Um, we, uh, we, we posted that tree here uh, in front of City Hall. You have seen that. Um, I just wanted to, to, to close my presentation by showing you uh, some of those hearts uh, that were drawn. And you see on the bottom right side uh, also uh, some hearts that, that thanking the MPD and, and thanking uh, a doctor or the fire department or also the city staff. And of course, uh, we, we really, really appreciate uh, thinking of us as well. So with that, uh, I conclude my presentation for tonight and stand by for your questions. Do we have any questions for Hans before we go out to the public? I don't see anyone. So now, do we have anyone in the public who'd like to weigh in? We don't. Okay, uh, Hans, I was asked today, um, and I don't know if you know this, we're in the orange tier. When can we expect to be in the yellow tier? Yeah, I I, um, I cannot answer that. Uh, every Tuesday is is when there is a new day or a new assessment. Um, I, I can tell you today statewide, I think none of the counties moved into uh, the next tier. Uh, it was a standstill across California. Um, and um, I, I, I think we are approaching there, but also the number of fatalities that we still register. Um, I think in the last uh, three days, there were seven fatalities. Uh, fatalities, if I look, if I remember the data uh, today correctly, uh, that will determine that as well. So for, for right now, we, we, we are in the orange tier and um, I'm hopeful that this will soon be lifted. Remember the, the, the governor told us by June 15th, everything will be lifted, so. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you for that update. And again, to remind people that many of the excellent slides that you saw can be found on the city's website and on the city of Monterey update, COVID update. You can see Dennis the Menace Park and our great staff getting their vaccinations and so on. So a lot of that great information is available to you. And I'm uh, we thank uh, Lori and the, the entire staff for putting that together for us. Uh, council comments. Anyone want to start? Uh, I see Council Member Tyler was ready to go. Uh, so first I want to give an update regarding Monterey One Water. So yes. at our last board meeting uh, in, in March, uh, this year is flying by, uh, but we decided to direct staff move forward with uh, updating the expand the the environmental study for the expansion project, um, and so we allocated an additional two hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars to have staff do that, and it's coming back to us. I believe next week is our board meeting, so we'll be voting later this month uh, to determine if we're going to be certifying that uh, that project, and that cues it up for. Uh, Cal Lam to be able to move in and, and potentially go into a water purchase agreement with our agency um, with, to support a, a water supply project on the, on the peninsula. So that's, that's really exciting and I'll keep you all posted. I'm sure you'll hear about it in between now and then, but I'll be sure to report out at our next council meeting. And then I just wanted to end with one additional thing. Um, I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't kind of acknowledge and, and recognize uh, uh, the historical day today uh, with the uh, with the George Floyd um, murder, uh, George Floyd getting justice. Uh, I, I think it's it's a great day to celebrate. And if we think about this, it was almost a year ago um, from, from when George uh, Floyd was was murdered. Uh, so 
it, it's it's just nice to to get to this point, knowing that we're moving in the right direction, but still so much work to be done. So, um, you know, I, I'm speaking frankly here, and I, I didn't uh, sign up to be on the city council necessarily thinking about um, racial justice. Uh, it was definitely something that I held close and dear to my heart, but it wasn't something that I was, you know, standing on on a mountaintop on. But um, these are real issues and people's lives are being affected. And it just makes me think of the last council meeting when we unanimously supported the, the resolution that I put forward. I'm just super proud to be part of this council and I look forward to the continued work on on creating uh, a more just and fair society for, for everybody, for all human beings. So thanks everybody. Uh, thank you for those really nice words. Uh, council member Dan. Thank you. So I have um, just a couple items. One is a MST update. Um, I think last week there was an article in the paper about the hand carts that are uh, going to be um, moving from Marina down to um, Seaside and it's on the old uh, South Pacific tracks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's exactly the same um, tracks that uh, MST is uh, planning on using their surf project, and that's to move um, uh, our buses, get them off Highway One, and move them uh, parallel to Highway One. And uh, MST is still uh, looking forward to starting that project soon. Uh, probably in about uh, a year and a half when we've secured all the funding. But I just wanted to let people know, because I think I brought up SURF before, uh, that, that the hand carts will not uh, uh, not uh, be a problem with uh, that particular project, SURF project. So I hope that we still support that project because it's a very important project. Um, the second one is I've had um, in communication several um, uh, people on the peninsula have asked me about the local coastal program. I know that we have had, we've looked at it in 2016. We had it updated, uh, then it hasn't been in front of the board since. And I know we're very, very busy. And that's basically what I've told um, the people that have communicated with me. But I know that it's a, it's a very important um, program that, or coastal plan that I'd like to see uh, uh, move forward uh, in the in the future, hopefully. And then, um, the sports center, yes, uh, I am the uh, council member that was at the sports center. It's great, I love it. And uh, there are quite a few people um, that uh, I see coming back and I'm really proud of the employees that are there. A lot of new faces uh, at the sports center, but it's clean, it's, uh, it's a, a great facility for the city of Monterey and I'm really glad it's opened again. That's it. Good. Council member Ed. There we go, let me get it unmuted. Um, Dan, thank you for uh, being the first one in the sports center. I'm sure you're there at like 5.30, right? Uh, you don't have to answer that. A 5.45. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so uh, congratulations on city staff um, and those that get to open their facility like the sports center and the Dennis Menace Park and the basketball courts. That's a a major move. I know our community has been uh, very patient. Uh, we have all heard from uh, the users of these facilities. So uh, an opportunity to celebrate one one step forward as we uh, get back to, at some point, some full full opening of the city of Monterey. Uh, Mayor, I think if you were there at 530 in the morning at the Sports Center, you may find that there's actually another person designated as the mayor of the Sports Center and Frank Sheeler, I'm sure, is back there early. Um, and he used to be a two-a-day guy at the Sports Center. So a lot of happy folks in Monterey. That's good. I know Frank. Yes. Yes. They're, they're all very happy. Um, I, I wanted to also just, I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff because um, Dan covered the Tamsi point on the rail car demonstration. That is for a short, short spot in Marina. So there won't be in, in, any interference but that is an opportunity to go participate in a demonstration, buy a ticket and get on a rail car and see that area from a different vantage point. I think that goes until the end of July as a test demonstration. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, I serve on the California League of uh, Cities and represent the Public Safety uh, Committee. And last week we had a very interesting 
subcommittee meeting of public safety um, where we went through uh, quite a bit of legislation and our role there is as the League of California Cities Public Safety uh, to make recommendations of support, watch, oppose, and so went through a variety of bills that have to do with public safety. Everything from police, fire, broadband, lots of topics. So a, a very uh, robust opportunity. Um, it's too soon in the process to report back the positions on the bills. Uh, the state legislation is very busy right now and there'll be more to follow in terms of new legislation. Um, and that committee oversees and watches and participates and as our mayor does and the city council writing letters of support or oppose on legislation that's coming. So there's a lot of things going on in Sacramento regarding new legislation and public safety. And the last thing I'll say is that um, on my role with the Transportation Authority of Monterey County, um, this next meeting we will be meeting in closed session uh, to take up continuing matters on uh, the uh, recruitment piece uh, for the replacement of our very excellent, outstanding executive director, Deborah Hale, who mm -hmm. has announced her retirement. Uh -huh. um, so she's going to retire uh, at the end of July. So the board will be going through a process for evaluating um, candidates and uh, recruitment uh, to replace uh, big shoes to fill Deborah Hale, who is also announcing that she will be taking a position, I think it's in 2020. Three, she will be the um, lieutenant governor for the Rotary uh, Zone, which is basically, I think, 75 clubs from Fresno to Monterey, Santa Cruz, uh, and Visalia. So she's going to be retiring and then serving a capacity as a, a governor for our Rotary Zone. So uh, just with that, that's about all I have, but I wanted to report the activities at Transportation Authority and on the, oh, one thing, on the League of California Cities business, um, next time I come back for the council, I'll announce the website where you can actually go and see the list of bills that we are monitoring and participating in. So you'll find some of them very interesting. And so those that want to dig a little deeper, the information's on the League site. And that's all I have. Good, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just yes, have please. one thing I want to share with you and with my colleagues, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of bring to your attention, because I think it's something we may see in the future. As you know, I served the first couple of years as the representative for the city of Monterey and Monterey Peninsula on the board of the, um, the energy yes. um, supply agency, which is the, um, so now it's called Central Coast Community Energy, CCCE. Very good. And, um, you know, when I stepped down, um, that was in deference to our fellow cities because we have one seat for Monterey, mm -hmm. Pacific Grove, and Carmel. Mm -hmm. And when we formed the uh, JPA, it really wasn't laid out what the process would be for how that seat would be shared among the three of us. Um, I think after I stepped down, um, there really wasn't a clear process for how I would be replaced. Um, and it's a little bit of a mess. I will just say this. Um, I think we need to adopt with the other cities an MOU that lays out a process so that, you know, every, I would say probably two years, it moves from one city to another city to the third city and, and back mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. I also would just share that in my experience, my first year on that board, the um, there are two policy, there are two boards. There's a policy board with elected officials, which is obviously where I served. There's also an administrative board with city managers and, um, and county <laughs> administrators. And the first year, for the peninsula's representative, I was our policy rep. Um, the administrative rep was from was the city manager from PG. We didn't really we didn't talk. I never never once, in fact, spoke with him. There were times he took votes on his board that I would say I didn't understand. And um, after the last 
year, um, Hans was the administrative rep. I was the policy rep. And I just would share that I think it worked much better to have um, the policy rep and the administrative rep be from the same city. It also just makes it much simpler in terms of a process of sharing those two roles and two responsibilities among the three different cities. But um, so I just wanted to let you know about that. I think there is some disagreement between Pacific Grove and Carmel. Um, I think it's in all of our interests to adopt a clear policy. Um, and I also think that policy should indicate that the roles for the policy rep and the administrative rep should be at the same city simply by virtue of coordination, communication, and all of that. It's just much easier when it's your own city manager, as I think you can all imagine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's see, uh, yesterday afternoon and evening, I attended the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District meeting. I'm the uh, mayor's, Peninsula Mayor Select Committee representative on that board. You better watch what you pray for because you might get it. And so uh, a few highlights. One is May is Water Awareness Month and the district along with Cal Am is going to be doing composting and gardening workshops. And they said a lot of people do attend those webinars. And something I'm sure is good news for all of our, our restaurants, the board last night extended for another year, outdoor seating without additional water permits. Good news. It is great news. And there is a formula. So for every two outdoor seats, the uh, restaurant would give up one indoor seat. And the reasoning behind that was is the there are much fewer outdoor seats and they're not always full, especially on a day like today. If you can imagine eating outside today, it would be really cold. So that's been an extended a year. So for food serving businesses can continue to use their outdoor areas without gaining uh, requiring uh, an additional water permit. So that was another emergency ordinance which lasts one year. And then it was um, there's an ongoing discussion, as you know, and not so much a water management uh, district issue, but the whole idea of what happens when we're back to normal, will we be able to continue to have outdoor seating? And the current policy of the water management district is, for example, when we have our permanent seating with uh, Big Sur, uh, the, uh, the brewery, and there's some on Cannery Row, that uh, <coughs> rules allow a 50% additional outdoor seating. <coughs> based on what's on the inside. So that's the current rule. I can probably say that that makes sense to me. And so that's continuing. The board adopted a two year strategic planning goals, including a revised mission, vision and values and objectives. It was pretty interesting. As a 35 year school teacher, I, I just love strategic plans. <laughs> You're all happy to have been through those. But it was fairly painless and, and the uh, facilitator was excellent. Then lastly, something really interesting that's probably going to be add to the water wars going forward is the district and Cal Am are working cooperatively to develop a comprehensive long-term management plan for Los Padres Dam. The dam is currently about 50% capacity because of sediment buildup. So, we needed to extend the contract because of various delays, but it's going to be very interesting to discuss the future of Los Padres Dam. There were a lot of plus and minuses to keeping it, expanding it, eliminating it. So it's, it's going to be an interesting discussion going forward, but this simply was to you know, continue the study so we all have the same facts to deal with. So that's what happened last night at the highlights of the, the meeting. Uh, city manager comments? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Since you brought up strategic plans, uh, uh -oh. what, what comes to, to my mind is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Austrian American uh, um, consultant, uh, uh, Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker was saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
<laughs> and what he means by that is strategy is, is, of course, an important part of any organization. But if you have a sound culture in your organization, um, it eats any strategy because, you know, you can count on a sound culture. And uh, mm -hmm. just want to share with you that uh, we, we, we work very hard to have a good culture in our organization and I subscribe to, to Pete Drucker's thinking on this one. Uh, what I wanted to share with you is uh, we, we uh, still have uh, openings for preschool programs. We understand there is still need in the communities. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to, to put a pitch in for that. And the other part is uh, along the lines of uh, Council Member Williamson talking about um, uh, racism, diversity, equity, inclusion. There's an event this Saturday in front of Colton Hall organized uh, to, to um, uh, dedicated to Asian and Pacific Islanders um, uh, discrimination. And uh, there will be various speakers there. And uh, it will start on Saturday at 11 a.m. in front of Colton Hall. So I think that is also a, a good, good plan maybe to, to show up for that event. Mm -hmm. and that's all uh, uh, what I have to share with you. Well, good. Well, with that, oh, look at that. There you go. So I want to I want to thank uh, our council, our outstanding staff, and our public for making this another productive meeting. Thank you so much. We'll we're going to adjourn our regular meeting and adjourn to a closed session. We have one item to finish up on. Shall we come back in about? Let me see. If we came back ten minutes, we eight forty six, eight fifty. Take a little break and see everybody at eight fifty. Good. Thank you all. Sounds good.